still up to December 2016. She was also a former police solicitor, but had to change this from September 2017 to August 2019. Mrs. Lerner is a currently the Royal Community Educator for the Peach Women Crisis Centre from August 2019 to date. Her professional legal skills include legal advice, legal research, litigation, legal writing, legal assistance, civil litigation, negotiation, and legal opinions. Ladies and gentlemen, our moot court judge for today, Justice Larry Oresua. If I would like to invite everyone to so uh, to show our appreciation. from the defendant and the members of the public. May it please this honorable court. Counsel's name is Emily, first initial H, and I'll be alongside counsel Demo, first initial J. We're representing the plaintiff in this matter today. Thank you. Submission is as follows. 
There are four grounds of submission, and I will be speaking for 15 minutes on the first two grounds, which are ground one, whether or not there is a serious question to be tried. The deprivation or diversion of funds by Thomas Inairai and the village headman breaches local laws and international conventions on women and economic empowerment that Fiji has ratified. Ground two, is there a prejudice to Thomas Inairai and the Walimbuka Primary School if the injunction continues in favor of the Nayabu Women Village Cooperative? Malaiti Co Council Fellow will speak for 10 minutes on the remaining grounds, which are ground three, the balance of convenience and who it favors if the injunction continues against the Masinai Rai and the Wani Muka Primary School. Ground four. Council, um, can you just refer me to the, um, the section of the submission that you have referred to? My lady, is this the preliminary issues? The case of uh, Lansing Linda Limited and Care 1991. That's a better to the case under. Thank you, Ali. Shmaidi, have no further question. Council seeks to continue. You may continue. Ground four, whether or not the injunction should continue. Council Fellow will end the submission with the plaintiff's prayers. We also reserve five minutes for rebuttals. Also, would you like the council to read out a brief summary of facts for this case, my lady? Yes. My lady, the Nayaba Women Village Cooperative is made up of about 20 women who are above the age of 50 and weave mats for the village which is then sold in markets and in silver and new soil. Most of these women only reach middle school up to class 7 when their fathers would tell them that schooling is a privilege and they needed to stay home. The REACH program funded by Girls for Women program has begun assisting village cooperatives such as Nayab Women Cooperative by giving them funding of $100,000 which will be administered by the UN for Women and the village headmen of participating villages. The funding map for two years has already seen the first payment of $50,000 to the village headman, Tomasi Nairai. In an evening meeting on the 1st of February, 2021, which was when the first funding was received, it was decided that the funding will be better spent on the Wadimuka Primary School. The school needs urgent water tanks because of a water problem in the area and fixing the leaking roofs as the Minister of Education has not attended to this ongoing request from 2019. The problem arises here as the women who the fund was meant for were not consulted and never part of the meeting on the evening of 1st February 2021, which involved Tomasi Nairai and his village elders. By 1st March 2021, the men have allocated the funding to the Wadenbrooker Primary School deposited the money into the school's bank account and are awaiting the quotations from Vinod Patel for the water tanks and the building materials. The women are fearful of the men as they are used to receiving orders, never questioning the judgment of the elders. However, here they are very upset that their hard work will not be realized because of the interference and diversion of funds by the village headman. Tomasi Nairai and the elders of the village they also know the risk involved and are fearful of the intimidation that these men may take against them. The women through Council Naomi Lala have filed an ex parte injunction and had it granted on the 15th of March 2021 and served Tomasi Nairai and Wadimuka Primary School on 22nd March 2021. No further question, Council seeks to begin with the submission today. Uh, you may, um, Much obliged. Mm -hmm. today's case is on women's economic empowerment. Women's economic empowerment in Fiji remains an unresolved issue till date. Economic empowerment of women is a development game changer because when more women participate in the formal or informal economy, their families, communities, and countries become wealthier. This empowerment requires removing barriers such as discriminatory laws, changing social and cultural norms that expect women 
to take on the lion's share of home and family care, and doing much more to address the drivers and causes of gender inequality, exclusion, and vulnerability. Economic empowerment means when a woman is economically empowered, when she has both the ability to succeed and advance economically, and the power to make and act on economic decisions. My lady, women's economic empowerment is a matter of human rights and social justice, which clearly has been denied and abused by Tomasi Nagarai and the village headman for Wani Boka Primary School in this matter. Whether there is a serious question to be tried. 
Second, the adequacy of the injunction as a remedy with no prejudice. Third, what would be the balance of convenience of each party should the order be granted? In other words, where does the balance lie? Finally, whether the status quo should be maintained. Whether or not there is a serious question to be tried may be as the first round, the plaintiff's submission, paragraph 4.2. Whether or not there is a serious question to be tried, the deprivation or diversion of funds by Tomasi Nairai and the village elders breaches local laws and international conventions on women and economic empowerment that PG has ratified. Relying on the case of American Cinema Co. and African Limited, the first test for injunction is answering the question whether or not there is a serious issue to be tried. It is not necessary for the plaintiff to show that it is more likely than not to obtain a final injunction at trial. All the plaintiff needs to satisfy the court at this stage is the claim has some substance and it is not frivolous or vexatious. If asked, in simple words, not a serious issue and has little to no success to be tried at court. Only if the plaintiff fails to satisfy the court that it has any real prospect of success will it fail this test. The defendant's interference and decision to divert funds owed to the plaintiff directly breaches provisions of the 2013 Constitution of the Republic of Fiji, hereafter referred to as the Constitution. Firstly, counsel for plaintiff relies on the provisions set. Counsel, um, have you filed any um, affidavits in this uh, matter that you might wish to rely on? Okay, so the no, my lady. Regarding this uh, interference? No, I did only the ex parte injunction on 15 of. Uh, on 15 of March? Yes. Yes, my lady. Yes, my lady. We rely on the same injunction. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, my lady. Firstly, councils for the plaintiff relies on the provisions set out in section 26, subsection 1 to 3 of the Constitution, which states as follows. My lady, this could be found in plaintiff's case bundle, orange tab page 24 and page 25. Right to equality and free. Sorry, my lady. Thank you, my lady. Section 26. Every person is equal before the law and has the right to equal protection, treatment, and benefit of the law. Subsection 2. Equality includes the full and equal enjoyment of all rights and freedoms recognized in this chapter or any other written law. Subsection 3. A person must not be unfairly discriminated against directly or indirectly on the grounds of his, of his or her Councils for the plaintiff is relying on gender identity and economic status in subsection 3, part A of the Constitution. But if you have no questions, Council seeks to move on with paragraph 4.1.4. You may proceed, Council. The above mentioned it provision is relied upon to question the defendant's decision to divert funds without the presence of Mayan Women Village Cooperative in the meeting. Rooted in the patriarchy setting in Fiji, the decision is from a male-dominated city without women who are excluded and discriminated based on gender. Thus, the defendant's theories breaches section 26 of the Constitution for discrimination and unfair treatment of Mayan Women Village Cooperative. Thank you, Marili. Marili, patriarchy is a male-dominant society or community that is fully run by men, and where women do not have the right to question them. And uh, well, uh, the
Were there also women present at the meeting? No, lady. So, um, it was just all male. Uh, yes, my lady. Thank you, Councillor. You Furthermore, the members of the Nayaga Women Village Cooperative have been deprived of their rights to economic participation as according in Section 32, Subsection 1 of the Constitution, Right to Economic Participation, which states, every person has the right to full and free participation in the economic life of the state, which includes the right to choose their own work, trade, occupation, profession, or other means of livelihood. Council submits that the diversion of funds. Council, um, so what you're saying is that um, the um, when the funds were diverted, the women were never consulted. No way. Uh, what about the um, the the, fund, the funders of uh, um, the funding uh, agency? Have they also? Uh, <coughs> Um, I provided an affidavit, or sworn an affidavit. Have you also uh, uh, provided an affidavit uh, from them? My lady, the goals for women, I apologize, goals for women were sending out a letter stating the purpose of the funds, which was only for the women and not for the village headmen, neither yeah, the elders. No it's part of the, uh, yes. the final of documents, isn't it? Uh, the, it's part of the affidavit that was sworn by the uh, <coughs> member of the uh, village cooperative, the women's uh, cooperative. Royal Council, so uh, what you're saying is that um, uh, what you're trying to say, uh, is, uh, you say the rights to economic participation. Um, so the, um, according to uh, to you, the women were never consulted when the uh, uh, when the funds were diverted um, yes, to other, uh, instead of uh, the purpose for which uh, goals for women had released the um, the funds. Very Council submits that the diversion of funds, as decided by Thomas Inara and the village elders, blatantly disallows the plaintiffs from full economic participation. Although the women have exercised their rights to choose their own work and trade for their livelihood and increasing streams of income, the defendant's interference is depriving their right to full economic participation. In order for women to advance and succeed in economic stability, Relevant resources and appropriate financing is essential to encourage competition in markets as well as fair and equal access to economic institutions. Apart from local laws, Council for Plenty also relies on international convention already ratified by Fiji. Firstly, Article 13 of the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, hereafter referred to as CEDO, is applicable to the case at hand. This could be found in the case model, Luther on page 14. Article 13, state parties shall take all appropriate measures to eliminate discrimination against women in other areas of economic and social life in order to ensure on the basis of equality of women and men. Council submits that the judiciary, which is one of the three arms of the state, must take appropriate measures to eliminate discrimination against women. The executive and legislature have already ratified CEDO. The court must follow suit and consider Fiji's international obligations, which is clearly undermined in Nayak village widespread patriarchy setting. Council, how, you, how, is, um, how are the actions of the, uh, uh, the first uh, defendant um, discriminatory against the uh, referring to discrimination? How is that discriminatory? My lady, Tomasi Nagai never consulted a woman 
before diverting the $50,000 to the Luka Primary School. Even during the meeting, the women were not even considered, neither consulted. was only meant for the Nair Women Village Cooperative and not for the Wani Muka Primary School. Thank you. Council for the Plaintiff also respectfully submits the following article from CEO to support submission. States party shall take into account the particular problems faced by rural women and the significant roles which rural women play in the economic survival of their families including their work in the non-monetized sectors of the economy and shall take all appropriate measures to ensure the application of the provisions of the present convention to women in rural areas. But the above article focuses specifically on rural women, like those who make up the Nayaba Women Village Cooperative. A particular member of this group is Rosalia Baba, who is 58 years old, widowed and lives with her two sons, one of whom is handicapped and requires constant care. Her son Penny is 21 years old, who farms but, do not, but does not really support his mother. The women's group consists of about 20 women, all of whom have similar situations like Rosalia and are the sole or main breadwinner of their families. Due to Thomas Mary and the elders' decision to divert women's funds, these sole breadwinners may not be able to provide for their families as Fiji's responsibility under Article 14 of CEDO are not fulfilled. Council respectfully submits that there is indeed a serious question to be tried. The deprivation or diversion of funds by Thomas Inairai and the village elders breaches provisions of the Constitution and Articles of CEDO which Fiji has ratified. If my lady has no further question, Council seeks to move to the second round. Thank you, my lady. The second ground, my lady, is, is there a prejudice to Thomas Inairai and the Wani Luka Primary School if the injunction continues in favor of the Nyaba Women Village Cooperative? Council for the Plaintiff humbly submits that continuing the injunction in favor of the plaintiff would in no way prejudice the defendants. Prejudice in the context of civil law is a loss or injury and refers specifically to a formal determination against a claim legal right or cause of action. Council submits that the ground of prejudice does not apply to the defendants. The defendants of this case will not suffer any loss or injury should the injunction continue in favor of the plaintiff. The fund by the Boston Women Program was never meant for the defendants in the first place. Furthermore, the purchasing of the water tanks and fixing of leaking groups for the second defendant is not the responsibility of the plaintiff in this matter, my lady. Council also respectfully submits that the defendant's legal rights are not breached by the continuation of the injunction as an adequate remedy. If my lady has no further question, Council seeks to call upon Council Femmo to discuss the remaining grounds. Thank you, my lady. to the balance of convenience and who it favors if the injunction continues against Thomas Mirai and not the Wani Muka Primary School. My lady, using the case of American Sinomid, that green of the Bangal authorities, the test is for the court to weigh the respective inconvenience or loss to each party, dependent on whether or not the injunction is granted. Council relies on the view of Lord Justice Totten in the case of Lansing Lin. The full case appended to the case of my lady, the code is from page 256 of the case, 
highlighted in green for your ease of reference, my lady. The code reads, the main question is then one of lesser evil. Will it do less harm to grant an interaction which subsequently turns out to be unjustified, or to refuse one if it is subsequently turns out that an injunction should have been granted otherwise referred to as a balance of the risk of doing an injustice? My lady counsel will first focus on the defendants before submitting on the part of the plaintiff. The impact on the defendant, my lady, on 4.3.3. Firstly, for the defendants, counsel submit that no loss of inconvenience will be shouldered by the defendants based on the fact that $50,000 was never meant for them in the first place. The UN Women Program was to be administered, only administered by the first defendant, and this has not been used, so there should not be any loss that should be shouldered by the first defendant, nor the second defendant. My lady, the primary goal for the funding by Goals for Women Program is to assist village cooperatives like that of the plaintiff and to provide funds to set up other small businesses to increase their streams of income. It was never meant to be spent on the winding hook of primary school water tanks, as well as fixing their leaking roofs, which are the responsibilities of the Ministry of Education, not of the plaintiff. Already all in all, Council re-emphasizes the fact that the defendants should not claim any loss, not inconvenience from the injunction, as despite patriarchy, they had never any right. They never had any right over the use of the fund. They have not spent the fund, therefore no loss should be shouldered by them. On the contrary, however, my lady, this has effect on the plaintiff. Council submits that the plaintiff faces an inconvenience if this matter goes further to trial. As long as the defendants interfere with funds rightly owed to the Nayabu Women Village Cooperative, the purpose of the fund will remain unmet. My Lady Council also respectfully submits that many of the women in the group are sole breadwinners of their families relying on the fund to make ends meet. Upon weighing the balance of convenience, the plaintiffs suffer more loss than that by the defendants. In the end, giving the Nayabu women their deals would favor not only the plaintiff, but the defendants too. Justice will only be achieved when the Nayabu women to whom the fund is owed are accorded their right to administer its use. If my lady has no question, Council would now like to move on to the court. Council, in what way is um, their interference? Um, are the independents interfering with the funds? Do you think, um, and then, um, of course, um, what is the basis for you bringing the action against the, um, the uh, seeking this uh, injunction against the second uh, defendant? I understand this is when you book a private school. So, uh, what, uh, what is the basis for bringing uh, uh, this action against when you book a private school? And uh, what is the interference? Thank you, my lady. My lady, with regards to the inclusion of the second defendant, the first defendant had actually met with his uh, elders, with his village elders, and they have decided without the consultation of the women to whom the fund is due, to divert the funds who would repair the second defendant, which is the prime minister. Thank you. Thank you. So is the... Um is it the diversion of the funds that you are saying that that is the uh, interference? Yes, ma'am. And what um, what legal rights of the uh, of the plaintiff uh, cooperative uh, will be uh, affected if? Uh, the uh, interference is allowed um, to continue. Thank you, my lady. Relying on uh, paragraph 4.1.5, as alluded to by my senior counsel, their right to economic participation will be affected if the, we continue to allow the dependency to interfere and divert the funds. Thank you, counsel. You proceed, counsel. Thank you, my lady. My lady, on the fourth and final round, we should ask whether or not the injunction should continue. On 4.4.1, Council respectfully relies on the facts of the case to make this submission. Firstly, again using the 58-year-old Rosalia 
who is a member of the group as an example. The facts of this case has been alluded to in paragraph 4.1.12. Yes, Council, I see the epidemic of uh, Australia is also filed. Your evidence as part of the uh, bundle of documents, this council? Yes, uh, it was not uh, filed. Council, if uh, it hasn't been filed, then um, council is giving evidence from the party. Um, I think uh, council, the, uh, her evidence has been filed. So you can uh, refer to her affidavit uh, when making your submissions. Um, the court uh, will only um, consider the matter based on the evidence um, that is adduced uh, before it. Uh, very well, counsel, you may proceed. Thank you, Marady. Marady, on Brasilia, her situation is common throughout the Nava Women Village Cooperative. The cooperative gives women the chance to earn from their wares in order to support their families and to increase their streams of income. These women have already been deprived of their right to education when they were instructed by their fathers to leave school as early as class seven, as attending school is a privilege apparently only suited to the male gender. Denying the plaintiff their right to deals, plaintiff denies yet another right, the right to economic participation, both rights denied by the opposite gender in the name of pet tracking. My lady counsel further submits respectfully that due to the lack of formal education, these women have close to no chance at all of getting formal employment. To make ends meet, initiatives like that by Goals for Women program at least offers a source of income for its participants and for the dependents to interfere and divert funds meant for the plaintiff is plain daylight robbery. Council submits that the denial of women's rights and empowerment are issues that need to be addressed. Council respectfully submits that the status quo be maintained and this injunction must continue. If my lady has no question, Council, now I'd like to proceed on to the closing arguments. Very well, Thank you, my lady. Relying on the elements of the injunction ex as explained in the American Assignment case, the first test that needs to be satisfied is answering whether or not there is a serious question to be tried. Council argues that women and economic empowerment is an issue of concern in Fiji. Certain provisions of the Constitution are not upheld as women continue to be discriminated on the basis of their sex and are denied full enjoyment of rights to economic participation. Secondly, the adequacy of the injunction as a remedy with no prejudice should be tested. Council again submits that the dependents of this case do not suffer any loss or injury should the injunction continue in favor of the plaintiff. The fund for the goals, the fund by the Goals for Women program, was again never meant for the dependents in the first place. My lady, for the third test, the balance of convenience between the two parties must be weighed. For the dependents, they have nothing to lose from this injunction, as the fund has not been used by them and it was never meant for them in the first place. For the plaintiff, however, not according them the respect and fund for their work leaves them with a great injustice. The final test for an injunction is whether the status quo should be maintained. Council submits that Fiji's prevalent setting of patriarchy, so evident here with women suffering in Nairobi, it contradicts its ratification of international conventions like CEDAW, in particular provisions on rural women and their right to economic participation. This injunction must continue in order to protect and uphold women's rights, respect for the rule of law, and to honor Fiji's international obligations. My lady, finally, st statistics recently obtained by Fiji Women's Crisis Center showed that there was a total of 332 reported cases of domestic violence in the period of January to February 2021 alone, with another 257 reported cases of other offenses victimizing women and children. Most women who are victims to domestic violence and other related crimes face a brunt of it due to the lack of economic empowerment and independence. My lady, women's empowerment isn't just a catchy slogan, it's a key factor in the social and economic success of the nations. When women succeed, everyone benefits. Women's rights and gender equality have come a long way. From Susan B. Anthony in the suffrage movement to young activist Malala, there is no tool for development more effective than the empowerment of women. If my lady has no question, Councilor, I'd like to move on to the final part of submission. Thank you, my lady. On to the plaintiff's prayer. 
counsel for the plaintiff asked the court to uphold the rights of the plaintiff as a quarter of the Constitution and to honor Fiji's international obligations. The counsel respectfully submits that the defendants are misguided in interfering with funds due to the plaintiff, and as such, it is respectfully submitted that this injunction must continue. If my lady has no question, counsel has not reached the end of submission. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. My lady, we have not completed the legal agreements on support of the My lady, this is a letter in which the plaintiff has filed an urgent relief by way of motion and affidavit seeking injunctive orders pursuant to Order 29 of the High Court Rules. My apologies. Before I continue further, my lady, I seek to serve the balance of documents to the court and also to the plaintiff in this matter. May I continue? You may proceed, counsel. Thank you. The court on the 15th day of March granted an order for the second name defendant to return the 50,000 in its HFC account and deposit it into the High Court Trust Account. The matter today before you, my lady, is for the hearing of the injunction application filed by the plaintiff. The defendants will rely on the affidavit of the first name defendant and also the head pizza of the second name defendant in our submission in dealing with the following issues. One, this case is a question to be tried for the Niagara Women Village Cooperative. Is a deprivation or diversion of funds by Thomas and Eli and the village admin breaching any local laws, constitution, international conventions, or human law, and economic empowerment that Fiji has ratified? Second one, is there any prejudice to Thomas and Eli and the Wanyabuka private school if the injunction continues in favor of the Niagara Village Cooperative? The third one, my lady, what is the balance of convenience and who does it favor if the injunction continues against Thomas and Eli? And the last one, should the injunction continue? My co-counsel, Mr. Eli, will be addressing the first issue of our submission this evening. Please, as your leadership, may I continue with my submission? Yes, Mr. Eli, you may proceed. The first issue that this submission deals with is that if there are serious questions to be tried, is the deprivation of or diversion of funds by Thomas and Eli and the village headman breaching any local laws, constitution, international conventions? The question has been argued having regards to the principles stated in the House of Lords in American Sinai Co. v. Ethicon Limited, 1975, which is in tab one of our case of bundles, bundle of cases, sorry. The House of Lords there decided that in all cases, the extent of the court's duty in considering an interlocutory injunction is to be satisfied that the claim is not frivolous or vexatious. In other words, that there is a serious question to be tried. The defendant submits the following. According to the facts of the case, it is stated that the funding of $100,000 was to be administered by the UN for the women and the village headman of these different villages, village programs in Fiji. 
Thus, the money received by the defendant was not only for the women cooperatives, but also the defendant for the benefit of the village and other village programs in the village. Furthermore, the defendant was aware of the fact that the money given to him was to be used for the women of the village. Hence, after the first payment of 50,000 was received, the defendant had held a meeting with the other village elders to decide how to use the funds for the betterment for the women and the village and it was decided that the money would be better spent on the purchase and installation of water tanks for Wainibuka Primary School, which is an urgent need. Uh, in the facts, 
it is stated that the breach program is under by the laws of four women and they on their own accord have started to assist the village cooperatives and furthermore they when they initially they gave the funds to the village headman it was only stated for the economic empowerment for women and the cooperatives however the fact that they were asking uh, the funds that the, were supposed to be used to broaden up the businesses of the women it was the idea of the women of the cooperatives themselves it was not actually part of the directives given to the headman so when the fund was received by the headman he actually discussed with the elders about the situation in the village and how it could be used to how it could be used for the economic empowerment of women which is related to the village at that point in time. Um, so, council, um, the uh, women, uh, uh, because the goals for women has uh, seen that the women have been working uh, very hard and that they are very, uh, um, that they've uh, taken their first step um, to, uh, you know, trying to be economically independent. Um, the um, epidemic of Rosalia um, states that uh, they have, uh, that it was uh, based on that, on uh, uh, that's the core, that the uh, uh, goals for women um, so that they could, uh, you know, um, fund them uh, because of uh, their, uh, that they were already uh, be able to uh, um, support themselves. Um, don't you think that um, the uh, diversion of the funds, um, you know, without without the women themselves being consulted in the council, uh, don't you think that um, that is uh, discriminatory? Madam, uh, about the discrimination part, it is the, uh, if you look at Cap Six, the Itoke Affairs Regulation, it is stated in the uh, Regulation Twenty Five that. The persons that are entitled to attend and participate in the proceedings at a meeting of a council shall be Itoke who are members of a land owning unit in that village, including school leavers and those Itoke who reside in or within the domain of village notwithstanding their place of origin. Thank you, Council. Uh, what is the way of the um, uh, Itoke Affairs Regulation, especially Regulation 25? Um, that's what the law says, Council, um, in the evidence. Uh, Rosalia, um, the evidence, uh, in her evidence, evidence she, she thinks that the, uh, the women uh, were never consulted. Madam, what uh, our client is trying to say that they were never stopped, even though, even like they were not asked, we admit that, but they were also not stopped from attending these meetings when it was held. So they could have put an initiative and be there when the meeting was held to what to do with the $50,000. Continuing, comparing the urgent needs of the hundreds of children with the needs of Nayabu women, the defendant came to a conclusion that the needs of the children require immediate attention and therefore needs to be prioritized. The expert. Oh, I thought you were going to ask a question. <laughs> the extension of the business of the women that are part of the Nayabu women cooperative can be brought into realization when the UN will be administering another amount of 50,000 in the following year. Thus the women are not being deprived of their opportunity but the defendant is only trying to look at the best interest of the children which is paramount and must not be compromised. It should, as I have already uh, quoted the section regulation 25 of Ethiopia affairs, I look to uh, elaborate more on that. That this provision stipulates that every token member, be it male or female, is allowed to participate in the meetings of the council. Thus, there was no patriarchal influence as women are actually allowed to participate in these meetings. Furthermore, it should be noted that according to the statement made by Permanent Secretary for Itoke Affairs, Naipote Katonitu Tambua, on 11th of April 2017, as published by the Fiji Sun, you can look at the uh, Jeff 7, women can actually become the head of the villages. Nowadays, and in the year 2017, there were already two females that had earned the title of village headman. Therefore, 
It can be denied that there may have been patriarchal system in PT. However, PT is moving away from such practices as shown in the law reforms and the selection of women as village headmen. Also, um, the, um, but this is referring to the um, uh, to the general uh, generally to uh, Itake, uh, uh legislation and to women's participation. Uh, but uh, what about uh, in this case? Uh, in this particular case, the court is only concerned. Uh, about in this particular case whether that was followed or not um, and whether the, uh, the women were consulted by the, uh, the village headmen. As I stated earlier that the women were not stopped from participating in those meetings when it was held. Uh, not stopping the women council is different from uh, consulting the women. Do uh, you agree, uh, council? I agree. However, and your ladyship, if you look at a village setting, whenever there is a village meeting, the elderman and the village chief does not look at a particular things such as discrimination. They do not look uh, at, uh, they do not discriminate between their subjects. So whenever they make a decision, they take everyone into consideration. Council, you said that uh, they don't think about discrimination, so um, are you saying that it's a practice? that uh, the women are not consulted? No, that is not a practice. However, we are stating that if the women were actually participants in the meeting, they have, and, they have, and if they had raised their concerns, the village headman would have listened to them at that point in time when the decision was made. The defendant further submits that there was no violation of any rights when diverting the funds to buy a water tank for Wainingoka Primary School. The first defendant in this matter is not violating any of the petty facts because, in fact, the first defendant was pursuing constitutional rights for the children of Wainimoka Primary School, pursuant to the following provisions of the 2013 Constitution of Fiji, which is uh, elevated in Jet 5 of the bunch of cases. Section 31 stipulates the right to education. Every person has the right to early childhood education, primary and secondary education, and further education. And Section 41 stipulates the rights of children, that every child has the right to basic nutrition, clothing, shelter, sanitation, and health care. For this matter, the one in Buka Primary School is facing water disruptions due to the water problems in the area. The school is in urgent need of water tanks, as well as fixing the leaking roofs, as the Ministry of Education has not attended to this ongoing request from 2019. The first defendant in this matter was looking at the welfare of the children of Wainibuka Primary School pursuant to section 31 and 41 of the 2030 constitution when he had called a meeting on the 1st February 2021 and it was decided that this money would be better spent at the, on the urgent need of the Wainibuka Primary School in the installation of water tanks. Therefore, the defendant in this matter have not violated any local laws, constitution, international conventions by directing the funds to Wainibuka Primary School. They are merely focusing on empowering the females of the younger generation and while doing so, the first defendant, defendant is also protecting the constitutional rights of the children of Nayabu village that entitles them to the right of education and also the right to basic nutrition. Therefore, we submit that for the, this first issue, the plaintiff's claim for injunction is, is not a serious question as the first defendant has not violated any rights of the plaintiff in order for a serious question to arise that needs to be tried for the reasons mentioned above. Are there any questions to reach you? So no, I'd like to call upon my fellow counsel, Mr. Matan Tambua, to address issue two, issue two of this case. Well, you are addressing uh, issue two of our submission this evening. May I draw your attention to paragraph 2.14? The question that needs to be addressed or discussed this evening is there a prejudice to Thomas Nebai and the one you private school if the injunction continues in favor of the Nayaro village cooperative? We, the plaintiff, we submit that this injunction will prejudice our plan. 
In this manner, in the event the court grants a permanent injunction, the defendants would be prejudiced as they will suffer an irreparable harm. The first defendant is a father of four children who attends Wanibuga Primary School. If the injunction is granted, then the first defendant's children, along with all the children of Mayan village, will suffer an irreparable harm, which is not being able to attend school because of a lot of problems in the area. It is an irreparable harm because of the closure of Wanibuga Primary School will be imminent if water tanks are not installed and thus would dep deprive the children from getting efficient education and it will prolong problem their studies. Since there has no been since there has been no response from the Ministry of Education since 2019 regarding the water tanks, it is unclear when would they deal with the urgent request regarding the water tanks? Subsequently, if the schools continue to operate without water, this would be in breach of Section 41B of the 2018 Constitution, as already alluded by my co counsel. In the case of National Commercial Bank of Jamaica Limited versus Polling Corporation Limited, 2009, UKDC, 16, 2009, one world law report, 1405. At paragraph 17, the Privy Council stated, like for you, my lady, to take two of our part of the purpose. It states, in practice, however, it is often hard to tell whether either damages or the cost undertaking will be adequate remedy and the court has to engage in trying to predict whether granting or withholding an injunction is more or less likely to cause irremediable prejudice. If it turns out that the injunction should not have been granted or withheld, as the case may be, the basic principle is that the court, whichever cause seems likely to cause the least irremediable prejudice to one party or the other. In applying this statement from the Privy Council to this matter, the defendant submits that the court should take whichever cause seems likely to cause the least irremediable prejudice in deciding whether to grant the injunction or not. Therefore, my lady, the defendants submit that there will be prejudice to both the defendant, if the injunction is granted to the plaintiff, our main area of focus is the best interest of the children, which is paramount. My co counsel will come and address. Counsel, um, I note that um, the injunction has been no uh, evidence. Uh, to contradict the, uh, the epidemic of Rosalia that was had is relied upon by the plaintiffs uh, um, that the uh, purpose of the funds because uh, um, the general discussion that the annex to that epidemic um, is a letter from both women um, stating that uh, the funds were to be, to be administered uh, for the women to assist them. <laughs> Uh, with their um, business and uh, for them to be able to uh, be self-employed and uh, also invest in their small businesses uh, council. So uh, um, that is the uh, that is uh, the evidence um, of council. Um, and uh, your client has not filed any um, um, any um, evidence to challenge that, um, that letter from those for women. Thank you, Marish. From the fact. If, if um, that is the case, um, Council, then what, uh, what authority um, is the um, 
village headman uh, acting under? Isn't he holding um, that fund um, um, as and uh, in trust for the women to administer it on their behalf? We agree on it that he holds the position to administer those funds. Once a fund had uh, been received, he met with the village elders in discussing about the funds. We are mindful of the, right, the rights of the women, but the, the decision that they have reached is for the best interest of the children in the village. The, we, from the facts, it can be seen that they will have a payment of 50,000 uh, coming in the following year. On that particular time, the money that has been received, the elders with the headman have thought that it best suit them at that particular time to address the issue of water problems in the school because they are looking at the best interest of the children, which is paramount. Then the interest of the women? We, we are mindful of the interest of the women. We, don't, we, we are not pushing them away. We are thinking about the interest in which the second payment will come and they can be utilized by the women. Was the issue of water was of a need that needs to be addressed at that particular time when the funds were received. What's the question? Best interest, 
interest of all children in one book of primary school, which includes females in this matter. So in other terms, we're also um, considering the needs of women, but at grassroots level for primary school. In, in the event if the injunction is denied, there will be no harm to the plaintiff in the expansion of their businesses because the second portion of the grant will be received the following year, the leadership. Then, therefore, dollars that has been uh, given in first, uh, um, the first portion um, of the grant and uh, that is supposed to have been already um, administered to the women um, for them to, uh, to assist them uh, in their businesses and uh, um, of course um, Rosalia, uh, Rosalia's um, um, epidemic evidence states that they are likely uh, they were looking forward to that farm, um, setting up businesses, uh, earning income, and um, the uh, epidemic also states that the urgency of this, um, um, emergency of the matter, which is the basis upon which the court had uh, um, uh, given the, um, the orders uh, as party, uh, was because there was, um, uh, the court was satisfied that this was not a frivolous or vexatious uh, um, proceeding and the um, the um, the money had already been uh, deposited into the school's account and um, they were already awaiting quotations. Um, that was the uh, urgency um, of the matter. And counsel, uh, my question is: um, if the fifty thousand dollars, if this injunction is removed, the plaintiff's argument is that. The fifteen thousand uh, dollars, the uh, then the um, the defendant will have uh, access. The defendants will have access to the fifteen thousand dollars, and they will remove that money. Um, the um, um, I know that there's no um, application for damages, um, but if, if the money is. Uh, is removed and there's no, uh, there's no, uh, the, the cause of action, um, uh, the purpose of uh, seeking the court's uh, an intervention is uh, defeated. Yes, Your Ladyship, um, on this issue, in terms of the balance of convenience, we, uh, uh, has your client have $50,000 to deposit in this court? That will be equal to the um, to the plaintiff's uh, um, application because um, the their submission is that the funds uh, were for the purposes um, of the women's uh, business and for women's uh, economic empowerment. Your Ladyship, are you questioning if we do we have any undertaking for damages? Yes, sir. Is there a client provided undertaking? Um, which of course I, I note that uh, both parties um, are not in a position uh, to provide undertaking um, to that amount. Yes, Your Leadership. Um, in terms of the undertaking for damages, um, at this point in time, since the interim injunction has been granted, the $50,000 is in the High Court's trust account, as we speak, Your Leadership. So, at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, um, Paragraph 2.19, concluding issue, my apologies, my lady. Paragraph 2.25, concluding issue 3.4. The, the defendants submit that the balance of convenience does not lie in favor in granting the injunction sought by the plaintiff. If there are no further questions, I would like to proceed with the next and final issue. You may proceed, counsel. Thank you, Your Leadership. Final issue in this matter is should the injunction continue or not? According to the case, with reference to the case of Matasau Holdings Limited versus Faint Investment Limited, 2002, 
The court had quoted Lord Denny in Harvard versus Wolfsburg, 1972, which stated that, and I quote, in considering whether to grant an interlocutory injunction, the right course of action for a child is to look at the whole case. He must have regard not only to the strength of the claim, but to the strength of the defense, and then decide what is best to be done. Your ladyship, applying this statement to this matter, this implies that in an issue of interlocutory injunction, the court not only has to make the decision based on the key points by the plaintiff that has been earlier submitted today, but also look at the merits of the defendant's cause and then make a decision on what is the best cause of action. Cause of action. As alluded to earlier by Melanie Council, we are stating we are submitting that the constitutional rights of the children of Wanimuka Primary School outweighs the claims made by the Nayavu Women Cooperative based on the fact that the fact that hundreds of children will be affected, affected if the injunction is granted. However, if the injunction is denied, there will be no harm suffered by the Nayavu Women Cooperative. Therefore, your ladyship, the defend defendant submits that the injunction should not be granted as the needs of hundreds of children outweigh the needs of the Nayavu Women Cooperative. If there are no further questions, my lady, may I proceed to our, our concluding uh, statements? You may proceed. So paragraph 3.0. Hence, the defendant submits on the following issues of this case. First, that there is no serious question to be tried and that the version of the funds does not breach any local laws, including constitutional constitution, international conventions, and women economic empowerment that Fiji has ratified. Secondly, that there would be a prejudice to both the defendants if the injunction is granted. Thirdly, the balance of convenience does not lie in favor of the grant of the injunction sought by the plaintiff. And lastly, your ladyship, the injunction that the injunction applied by the plaintiff should be denied. Now, if there are no further questions, may I proceed with the prayers, your ladyship? That in light of the discussions referred here and before, the defendant prays to this honorable court for the following orders for the application of injunction not to be granted. If there are no further questions, your ladyship, I'd like to um, conclude our submission. Very well, my lady. My lady, we have now concluded one hour, 40 minutes of our May it please this court, counsel for the plaintiff seeks to submit the following points for rebuttal. The structure of the rebuttal would be on the said four grounds by the defendant. First, in relation to the first ground, where my letter friends claim that the money received by the defendant was not only for the women, but also for the defendant for the benefit of the village. But it seems like my letter friends have forgotten the facts of the case. The fund by those who reached program was never meant for the defendants in the first place. As such, we request the counsel for the defendant to stop misleading the court by providing wrong facts. On the same ground, my learned friends are claiming that the defendant held a meeting with other village elders to decide how to use the funds for the betterment of women and the village. And it was decided that the money would be better spent on the purchase and installation of water tanks for Wanibuka Primary School, which is an urgent need. Counsel for the plaintiff would like to correct my learned friends here, my lady. 
that the given facts did not mention that the village elders considered how to use the funds for the betterment of women, and again we asked the defendants to not mislead the court with wrong facts. On the same ground, the defendants in this submission argue on the urgent need for water tanks for the children. My lady, with this, my lady, this with reference to the defendant's submission, point 2.5. The Nayabu Women Village Cooperative are not responsible for purchasing water for the school. That is the responsibility of Ministry of Education. Why should the Nayabu Women Village Cooperative shoulder the responsibility of another party? Moving on, my lady, councils for the defendant already are women. I apologize, my lady. My lady, already the women undermine in their rights to make the women a hand many offensive. Section 26, section 32 of the Constitution, which is the supreme law of the land. Yes, the plaintiff supports the rights of children, but what about women? What about our mothers? What about their rights? My lady, my other friends downright exaggerate talking about water tanks which still awaits the assistance from Ministry of Education. Perhaps their meeting by the defendants can focus on men doing something about the school instead of relying on funds for women. To say that women can wait for the next payment, what is the guarantee that the men will not interfere? Moving on, councils for the defendant are denied that there was no violation of any rights. Councils of plaintiff again objects that Nerabu Women Village Cooperative's economic rights was violated. Referring to paragraph 2.2 of the defendant's submission, the underlying statement is distorted and it, mislead, and it misleads the court. Based on the brief facts, the fund would have to be administered by the UN for women and the village headman. Quoting facts as per case scenario, administered by the UN for women and the village headman. What the council for defendant have done is evident in the underlying phrase in paragraph 2.2. They have added the word the to change the facts completely. Administration of funds from UN for women to village headmen for purposes of assisting the Nayak women. My lady, justice delayed is justice denied. Arguments of the defendant are based on misleading and distorted facts. Therefore, it respectfully must be disregarded by this honorable court. Should my lady have no further question, counsel comes to the end of the rebuttal points. Thank you, my lady. Your Ladyship, with respect to our learned friends, firstly, the fact that they raised up about paragraph 2.2 about uh, our submission, the underlying phrase that we added the word the to the village headman in front of village headman, it should be noted that according to the facts, paragraph 6, sorry, paragraph 5, the REACH program is funded for those, by the goals of women has begun assisting village cooperatives such as the Nayabu Cooperative by giving them funding of $100,000 which will be administered by the UN for women and the village headmen of these different village programs. So therefore we did not add the word the and try to mislead the vote. Furthermore, we would also like to state the fact that in paragraph 5.2 of the plaintiff's submission they have not substantiated the facts that they claimed. The plaintiff has failed to provide evidence as to the source of the and source and the authenticity of the information. Furthermore, we would like to highlight that in their submission, our fellow counsel had stated that the funds that was administered to the defendant was not for the defendant, but only for the women. And as we have already st uh, stated, that it was also for the village headman. To add on that, the plaintiff further stated that in paragraph 4.3.4 that the primary goal for the funding by goals for women is to assist village cooperatives like the plaintiff and provide funds to set up the other businesses, other small businesses to increase their streams of income. When in the facts, it is stated that the goals for women only stated that the funds were for the benefit of the cooperative and did not specifically state that the purpose for those funds was to set up other small businesses. 
The women of the cooperative came up with that idea themselves, and when they approached the Codes for Women organization, only then they, the organization stated that they were willing to write a letter to the headman that would consist of the purpose wanted by the Nayahu women cooperatives. So in other words, when the defendant made the decision to help the school to allow children to continue their studies, he was in compliance with the directives given to him in the beginning. Secondly, in the paragraph 4.3.7, the plaintiff stated that many of, many of the women in the group are sole breadwinners of their families relying on the funds to make ends meet. However, this statement is also inconsistent with the agreed fact. Yes, many of them are sole breadwinners, but they had never relied upon the funds granted to them to make the ends meet. They were able to survive without the funds already. They only saw these funds as an opportunity to better their life. It should be noted that injunction is an equitable remedy granted at the court's discretion, and those who seek it must come to court with clean hands and full facts. In the case of Gold Rock Investment Limited versus Itoke Land Trust Board, which is in tab 4 of the case, bundle of cases, the, in paragraph 12, the court had stated that even suppression of any material facts would be detrimental to the party that seeks it. Similarly, misrepresentation of facts should also have the same effect, and I leave it to the court's discretion to decide whether the mis misrepresentation made by the plaintiff was severe enough to be detrimental to them. Thirdly, in paragraph 4.4.2, the plaintiff had submitted that these women have already been deprived of their rights to education when they were instructed by their fathers to leave school as early as class 7, as it is a privilege, apparently only suited to the male gender, denying the plaintiff their rightful dues. It was never mentioned in the facts that the, the words, it is a privilege, meant that it only was suited for the male gender. Another meaning that could be derived from this statement, if we follow the footsteps of our learned friends, that it is a privilege which the, probably the father could not afford because they did not have enough money and were facing hardships. And that is why he did not send her to school. Because back in those days, when she was in class 7, it was year 1975, which is 46 years back from now. Studying in primary schools and secondary schools was not free. Parents had to pay school fees, buy uniform, buy school books. So in other words, it was a privilege, but only for people that could afford it. To add on, in regards to the topic of patriarchy, as brought about by the plaintiff, Fiji may have been a country that had practiced patriarchy, and the alleged discrimination which the plaintiff talked about in paragraph 4.4.2 and 4.1.12 about Rosalia. When the father of Rosalia had stopped Rosalia from further studies and when she was in class 7, could have been possibly the result of patriarchy. That's what they stated. However, it should be noted that the incident that happened with Rosalia, as I said, was in 1975. And CEDO was actually ratified by Fiji in, on 28 August 1995. Ever since then, Fiji has implemented many laws for the sole purpose to prevent such type of discrimination in Fiji. One of it is the Fiji National Gender Policy 2014, which actually is a states about sexual harassment that prevents Awoka from getting sexually harassed, especially females, in workplaces. Furthermore, even the 2013 Constitution itself is a creation that came after that came into existence after the ratification of CEDO, and it embodies CEDO. And some examples of those laws were breached by none other than our learned friends that represented the plaintiff in this matter. Also, just like us, there was no undertaken as to the damages given by the plaintiffs in this matter.
they were urgently discussing about the urgent needs that arose from the water problems in the area, and especially, especially they were talking about the best, under, children, best interest of the children, which is paramount, because children cannot cater for themselves. They need to be looked after adults, looked after by adults. So as I was saying, that even the plaintiff had not showed any undertaking as to the damages to the defendant. And if there is no undertaking by the plaintiff, we have by some that it is one of the main principles in injunction applications to be granted. So in other words, if the defendants win this substantive matter, will the plaintiff be able to pay for the damages suffered by the defendants? And then before ending my submission, I'd like to urge the court before making the judgment to consider whether it will be fair to repeat the actions of the past. Rosalia did not get to study past class 7 due to her father's views of whether it was patriarchal, patriarchal view or maybe it was a hardship that he suffered. We would never know because it was, it's not being tried in this case. However, but the young children of Nayahu have been given the chance to finish their studies. Going to schools is being sponsored by government right now. Getting educated is a constitutional right which nobody can take away whether the child be male or female. Would it be right to prevent students from getting proper education by granting an education or would it be better to allow the younger generation to reap the benefits that resulted from the year, years of struggles suffered by the older generation? Thank you. Is there, are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Submissions are noted. The um, court um, will adjourn um, for our third session. All rise. Now, this part of the program, I will kindly request the leadership. Ms. Lavinia Rousseau to provide the brief feedback of this week's competition. <coughs>